welcome. It is AT Town Hall time. It's good to see everybody again. Big, big, big group today. Very excited. Um, as we were saying before um, the recording, you know, you, you, you add the right phrasing into a title, talk about the IEP and AT, and then add the word special event, and voila, people come, which is wonderful. So it's good to have you all here today. Um, I am going to sit quietly and turn this over to I, uh, Kelly. I'm going to turn it over to you. I don't know. You were the maker of the slide or the sender <laughs> of the slides. Ah, oh, voluntold. Voluntold. Another there it is. Staple. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. I'm Kelly Fonner, and we have members here from the quiet leadership team. And many of you um, are a part of the quiet group on the list and other contributions. And one of the things that we've all been noticing is a lot of discussion about AT in the IEP. So over, and it's been going on for about, I would say since early February, people have been talking- Or since about, 2004. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but in Sorry. recent times, for the last two months, we've seen a lot of you know discussions that have happened on the quiet list. We've had discussions here on AT Town Hall for little pieces. We've had things on AT chat and in other forums. So we just started, the quiet leadership team just started gathering up some of those questions and um, introduced the idea to Mike to see if we could do this through um, AT New Jersey on AT Town Hall. So this is not a presentation. This truly is, because Mike will you know, kick us all off if we start to present. So, <laughs> This is really ahead, about a yes. discussion. So we have um, kind of four groups of questions, I think it is. One is just starts out with how is AT included in your IEPs, just so we can hear, you know, and, and chat a little bit about all the different ways in which people are doing that. And if your educational agency have any guidance or is everybody on their own, you know, free for all. Um, is there any, a second topic can be, is there any professional development that's happening in your school system or in your agency around AT and the IEP? And we already know there's one happening soon uh, from somebody that's here. And then we also want to know things that are related to that. You know, some of the things that have come up as discussion points are how does you, uh, how do you document the services, not just the stuff? but the services of assistive technology specialist in your district. Um, in the past couple of weeks, we heard people say that they are included in the IEP with their time. Other people are consultation only. So that's an interesting part of discussions. And then lastly, the topics come up of um, how does the way you write AT supports in the IEP have an impact on funding um, for services? So, Truly, we don't need to take these in any order other than probably just get us started with this first topic of, I mean, Mike's got the, if you need to see Mike's screen, you can pin him um, and put him in the middle of your screen. Uh, where does your educational agency have AT guidance documentation and, and what does that look like? Ready, set, go. As we're going, we'll have other members of the of the quiet leadership team introduce themselves too. We added um, we added documentation about three years ago, and it's part of the manual that we have on how to use assistive tech in the system. And we used a uh, a flow chart for the how you determine whether or not a student you're considering um, assistive technology or not. And then it includes the, what is the process and there's some wording on how you put uh, assistive technology into the IEP uh, within the document. Thanks, Irene. Irene, Irene can you... Um... Can you tell us a, a little bit more about um, what that document might say or um, what, it, what the specifics of the guidance are? Irene, you Irene you're muted. 
I need to take a second to pull it up so I don't say Oh, it okay. Um, Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, no. no pressure, Irene. We're not looking at you. I, know. <laughs> I don't feel looked at it at all. No, not doing it. I'm looking somewhere else. You are so good to me, Mike. <laughs> um, Kelly's so, looking at you. I can see her. <laughs> see, I'm, reading, I'm reading the chat. <laughs> okay. Um, it starts with just an overview of what it is, which is a repeat of the law, basically and then talks about who can receive the service in our district and gives like a laundry list of different ways and, and types of services or devices and, and services. And then it has four questions that you should always consider every IEP meeting. So in theory, people are supposed to ask these questions when you get to the part where you say, you know, is, do you need to consider assistive technology and the questions are does the student currently use at or devices or services is the student making adequate progress on their goals is the student currently accomplishing required educationally related tasks with existing support and is the student participating in the uh, least restrictive environment with dignity and independence and there's kind of a yes no scale so if they, uh, depending on if they say yes to those questions or no to those questions, do you add con your consideration? Um, and then when you talk about the consideration, there is uh, there are some other, oh, did I put that in there? It may still need to be added in. There were some words that I used about how to, con how to write that consideration like, Assistive technology is being considered for this student in the areas of A, B, and C. Um, other areas may be considered as time passes or something similar to that. Or at this time, the student uses assistive technology and it is, uh, it is effective for their current educational needs. So no more consideration at this point. And then um, so, so that there's one for pro and one for con. Uh, and it's required that every time, well, by law, but also in our, in our documentation, it says every time you have any IEP meeting at all, this question is that these questions are asked. And then all our services are listed as a continuum so that they can look at the continuum and see um, whether or not they need to, they need to have further assistance from, from the, AT coach. That makes sense. Thank you. Sure. I like that, Irene. It's it's giving people a little bit more meat to the whole idea of you must consider. Okay, but what does that mean to me? And then it gives them some questions that at least start the conversation about that. And then they could they could easily jump off from there, which I think is always um, so important. And then gives them a, a, a rationale that yes, or, or it gives them that understanding, oh, we're doing consideration. We're actually talking about it. This is what we should be doing. Right. Um, I think kind of uh, just in time training, you know, yeah. so that here comes the question. So here, just through a feeling, you know, looking through a series of questions, you give people more information just when they need it. Yeah. Irene, there are people asking where you're at, where you are located. Well, I, um, wanted, to give, I wanted to give Susan McCluskey uh, some credit for those questions because she and I worked together and she said, oh, these are the questions. Some of those were questions from where she, she's in, in Florida. Um, I am in Vancouver, Washington at Evergreen School District. Nice. With it. It's awesome. Thanks, Irene. Was there another question? If there was some way you could share. Um, yes. I'll put a link in the uh, chat box. Awesome. Great. And this, hi, this is Joan. Um, I'm wondering, Irene, if that's something you'd be willing to 
um, let us put in the quiet resource bank because this question comes up so frequently and that way it would be there as a resource for all I'm, of the folks on the quiet list. Mm. Yeah, I, I would be so pleased if people looked at it and gave feedback and we could make it better and better and it can go wherever it wants to go. I just, you know, it's just kind of a, the starting piece I put in there. So that if, would if be you, great. If you guys if, think it's worth going in there, if, that'd be fabulous. I'm really excited about it because like Mike said, it breaks down what it is we're supposed to do when we consider AT. Um, not just that you consider AT and our, don't ever, ever, ever ask, did you consider AT yes or no? Because when I was at a state agency and I went out to do compliance monitoring, when people had, did you consider AT and they checked no, it was great because I could instantly hit them with a violation mm -hmm. and, and don't make it easy for people like me. Um, you know, always ask what was the outcome of consideration, but I love, love the things that you put in there because it guides people through actually what we're supposed to think about when we consider. Oh. So if you go to the quiet list um, or just send, send a PDF or something to quietleadership at gmail.com and I'll make sure it gets up there. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amy. Lisa, I, I see that you you're saying that Florida um, is working on a similar thing that might go actually into the state IEP. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so about a year and I don't know, pandemic time brain kind of mushed together when that actually happened, but we had a whole committee that put together, you know, right now it is, a, you know, in our special considerations, it's a yes or no. Um, and we built out an entire, you know, if you pick, you know, yes, drop down sets of menus that give information about what, what was the consideration process like and what, what were the results of that consideration. We rallied for them to actually try to put it at the end of the IEP instead of the beginning. Um, and we, I think, lost that rally. But the goal is that it is as they're doing those special considerations in the very beginning and when they, if they hit no, it actually kind of says, are you really sure? <laughs> and says assistive technology could be considered blah, 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 blah. You know, um, it lets them stay at no if they want to, but it gives them a little bit of like a reflective feedback on the fact that they might be missing some assistive technology like visual supports that would be considered AT. Um, so the whole, uh, we just had a meeting last week and we're told that they hope that it's rolled out by August um, in our updated peer. So probably 80% of the districts in our state use the statewide IEP system um, that everyone, you, it's really nice because if I get a kid from Broward County, I have their IEP in a day versus waiting for records. They just transfer it over and we can start using it within the system. So the goal is that we're adding that consideration in is it, it's probably going to mean that we shift how we do training a little bit um, to, to try to include it in some of the IEP training we do. We were doing it separately. Um, and I think maybe it will, it will, I'll, I'll probably work towards developing a module that's within our IEP training um, instead of separately. Um, so hopefully by August that's in there and I can actually show what it looks like. Um, if they actually accept everything that we wanted, it will be really awesome. Thank you. It sounds really exciting. You know, I want to say that um, I, I, I'm, for a variety of reasons, I'm getting to work with quite a number of states um, these days. And one of the things things I see that I think both of you are um, exemplifying is that we're moving away from large, uh, you know, hour long conversations about consideration and how to do consideration to short lists of questions like this. Um, I think there's been a a real recognition lately that um, in, in terms of doing consideration, there's, there's maybe five minutes in an IEP team meeting um, where you can have that conversation in the context of the IEP team meeting. And um, Georgia has a project they're doing right now that's called Take a Minute. 
And their goal is to get every IEP team to, to talk about AT for one minute in, in the context of the IEP meeting. So that, that move away from here's all the complicated issues around consideration to the kinds of things that you're both talking about is, um, is interesting and um, I think very wise if we really want everybody to, you know, to do it. Um, so I just thought I'd mention that. And Tiffany, I see that you've put a document in the chat uh, about the Oklahoma ATTA document. I did, and actually Gretchen's on the call today, and she's from our Oklahoma Able Tech, which is a fabulous resource for our teachers. But I think Gretchen would probably agree with me that one of the things I run into is these resources are out there. They're on the State Department of Education's website, mm -hmm. but so many of my teachers don't know about it. And when I send it to them, they're like, where has this been? I'm like, well, this is the update from 2021. So it's been around for a while. <laughs> um, getting that knowledge out to our teachers is harder, it seems. I mean, and it, everyone wants to check the box, yes, no, and not think any further. I wish we could almost embed it inside as a link inside of what we call our ed plan. Um, it works kind of like yours does in Florida, where as soon as a student transfers and it's approved, it goes up and down, up and down. And oh, Gretchen's updating again, which is probably because we're working on, we're part of the AIM cohort. So we're doing some really positive things in the state. It's just a matter of getting that knowledge into all of our teachers' hands seems to be the real big disconnect. And Tiffany, you bring up a good point and we've got, I'm gonna have Mike change a slide here behind him. That one of the, some of the questions that people have been bringing up is, is there ongoing um, professional development regarding AT and the IP. Who's available to do that? You know, when does that take place? So what happens out there with everyone? I think these examples that we just shared are great, are great ways, and they should be kind of categorized as PD in a way. It, it's simple bite-size PD. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea of what, of what Irene and Alyssa were talking about and what Gail picked up on, um, is so powerful and it also makes people a little more, maybe, I don't know if willing is the right word, but I'm gonna use it, willing to dive into this because when things are hour long presentations, that has an air of expertise to it. And it almost facilitates the expert model. Like, well, I'm gonna wait, man, if they had to talk for an hour, that's probably complicated. I can't do that myself. But if it's three or four questions, and it's written in plain, plain language uh, that educators understand. And at the end, you can, in essence, say, congratulations, you did it. You considered it. That's what you're supposed to do. It, it kind of demystifies it a bit, which I think is really powerful. Yeah, keeping it from being that separate entity. Yeah. Oh, let's right. worry about the educational components. And then we'll look at assistive technology, right? But that mm -hmm. it's infused together. Yeah, I like that. I wonder if I could actually back up a step. Sorry, because um, I, I think I was the person who actually asked the question on the quiet list in February. I, I guess I know it's come up before, apparently, but because um, I am brand new to AT, I'm brand new to my district. My district has not done it really hardly at all um, in the past. And so I guess my question to even reel it back a little bit is not just the IEP, but in the evaluation process, like where does it go in the evaluation? Because I'm I'm writing up an AT evaluation that I did with a kid for literally for a meeting today. And like, there's no spot in our IEP online to put, I'm just putting it like in the other section. Like, I, I don't even know like where to write it in the IEP. That's the other thing that's really interesting to me is where to even write it in the evaluation so that then those checkboxes can even be discussed later on at the IEP meeting. So I'm, I'm kind of just winging it, which is fine, but I'm um, just trying to figure out, I guess, I'm wondering what other people do even in the evaluation documentation, because um, we do, what I've been doing is just a lot of like open-ended statements, because obviously AT is an ongoing evaluation. It's not like, oh, okay, I did it once and now we're done, but um, yeah, I, I don't know, and I've been writing a lot of like, oh, some assistive technology things might be used, including alternate AAC or visual schedules or speech to text or whatever, 
but they'll just continue to be evaluated as the need arises or something like that. That's kind of just what I've been writing and just being like hoping for the best from there. So I don't know if anybody has any other language, I guess, or thoughts or things either in the evaluation or the IEP as far as what they say to show that. Well, that especially, especially if you're using like ours, Oklahoma's is called Ed Plan, and it has, here's test A, here's your results. Here's test B, here's your results. AT doesn't fall into a nice, pretty <laughs> test A, here's your results kind of format. And so I know some teachers, I've seen them put it just in a area of, um, of the needs, just as a, like you're saying, a running log. But the other thing I don't see, and is even more painful to me, is the goals never make it. There's hardly ever do I get a goal for AT. And we really need the goals. If we want these kids to be successful, they have to be practicing with it. Um, and it has to be a goal. And I, I have some administrators who will flat out say in Oklahoma, no, it can't be a goal. Why? It's something that needs to be measured and the kid needs assistance in learning how to do. Um, but yeah, so that's another area that's really hard. I was gonna say, Melissa, sometimes what I will do and um, is kind of break it up as far as what they're currently using. So. Um, you know, that could be part of your assessment and then it going in the PLAF or your PLOP or whatever folks are calling it, depending on where you are, right, that current level. So if they're, you have that ELA section and writing, so here's their writing ability and they have this ability with this tool currently. So at least you're getting a current status and of the academic focus that is being met with that tech done tool. Um, and I find that is at least then going to help flow through your IEP, because if you've considered it in your current performance, you're going to have that academic skill with your tool. And then that's going to lead you down into your supplementary aids and services, which comes later. Um, so then you have this kind of documentation of AT throughout, but it's also wrapped up into, it's not an isolated skill, right? Because our AT isn't isolated. It's, it's a tool to meet their academic needs. So that's kind of how I like to look at it and encourage teachers to write it. Um, it's not a separate AT function, but just how it embeds into there, if that's helpful. Yeah, Tracy, that does help. That whole idea, and, and Tiffany, it's interesting, this idea of, of uh, of AT and where it should go as goals or as tools supporting other goals. Um, I, I think there can be a moment where it could be its own focus and that might be in the learning stage of the tool. Um, but then it really does shift pretty quickly to these are, these are supports to meet these goals, this goal in writing, this goal in reading, uh, executive function, whatever it might be. Um, and, is, and that's, of course, what makes this so tricky and fun to deal with all the time, right, is where do these things go? Um, and how do we um, get this information in? I saw Alyssa said that hers, her form, it's just an open-ended box, so it goes in the same place as other test scores. Yeah, that, that's kind of how it is here, too. Uh, that's what I've seen here in New Jersey. If I've done it. Oh, sorry, Irene. A lot of times we'll just... Um, kind of go back to the concept that uh, an evaluation for like every three-year eval is to determine if the service is needed mm -hmm. so the actual wording in the IEP talks more about you know we've determined that we need there needs to be service in this area in these places and um, we're going to do that by providing trials in in the future and kind of say yes we get the service but putting the details of what that service is going to really look like comes later in the defining trials is not the assessment or evaluation. Yeah. Rebecca, you want to jump in and then on me, I'll go to you. I was just going to say, as I've been doing, so when our kids three-year evals come around, if they've been needing AT, um, I've been pulled in a lot on our some of our younger students and our more complex needs. Um, I write my email and I just attach it in there and then we work within the consideration to write but um i leave even my 
really open and it's very open and it says these are the tools that I suggest at this point in time, but it will continue to be considered as the student progresses through their levels or through the grades right. because it's always changing based on the kiddo. Yeah, yeah I agree 100%. Go ahead, Mia, jump in. I'm not going to call you Amy because you said sorry. You're Amy. No, okay, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I was doing two things at once. Um, I just wanted to say that my perspective, hi, um, that my perspective comes from being a teacher and now for the last seven years being a, you know, a assistive technology and technology support person and, and seeing how it's done in seven districts. And what I would say is that um, the, in the professional development that we've been doing in the last seven years in our districts, the how people interpret the law has changed. So that's number one. I was in a large district, still am, Orange County, and we were in an expert model where, where we had, like when you clicked or when you checked AT on the IEP, that meant that you were getting a, um, this is seven years ago, that we, you were getting um, a device, like, a, like it had to be an actual you know, um, high-tech device, right? So over the last seven years, we have moved from now you check the IEP, um, even if you're using pencil grips, right? Like that consideration process is at every IEP meeting and there has been much more power given to the teacher and the team, the school-based team versus the extra model. Um, I, I, I think that's happened also because technology is more available and the, the, the definition of assistive technology is more, I think people understand it better, if that makes any sense. I think for the longest time, it was just like assistive technology, if you're just a teacher, right? Like, oh, AT, like when you put it on the IEP, that means it has to be like a big thing or an OT came in to do something or a SLP came to, in to do things. Like that's what teachers, you know, teachers were kind of told. Um, and the PD that we're doing currently revolves around accommodations. So you going to that question that says, when does PD take place? The state of Florida, um, four years ago, um, made a new accommodations training. And in that new accommodations training, they were very, in, they were there, the intent was there to make sure that the people who got trained on that training were compliance people and technology people, assistive like technology or technology people, so that there was a, a common message being delivered. And so I, I see that as an issue too in some states is that the compliance people are saying one thing, right? And it's written in like the matrix, whatever that they what, that people go off of or the IEP manuals that people go off of. It's written one way, right? But then the AT people translate it a whole nother way. Well, who, who attends the trainings? The teachers. Who's running the trainings in the state of Florida? It's mostly compliance people. It's not AT people. So if you have a compliance person talking about accommodations, but not really giving people a solid understanding of what assistive technology really is, then you have like huge gaps. And listen, I knew the definition of assistive technology, but that didn't mean I knew the definition of assistive technology, right? So you don't know what you don't know. Like I could regurg I could have regurgitated it to you, but the process and the impact of what I did was based on what my district did. Now it's like we say you have to consider AT and this is what the definition of AT is, but we're gonna actually show it to you. And people are like, oh my gosh, like a um a schedule, like a picture schedule could be assistive technology. Yes, let's go through the definition and you answer the questions. Is it an item, blah, 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 blah. Can it be modified, brought off the shelf, blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my God, it's assistive technology. I never knew that. So I think it has changed, at least in Florida, so drastically in seven years um, that finally we're getting closer, but we still aren't getting the teachers. That's the problem is we're getting ESE teachers to come, but gen ed teachers are not 
attending the accommodations training. The people who are attending the accommodations training are the are the ESE teachers and the staffing specialists and the people that kind of already kind of know a little bit, maybe they're learning a little bit more. But the I see a big problem is we still aren't getting the population that we need, which is the population of gen ed students. That's all I'm gonna say. Gen ed teachers, sorry. Yeah, it's a great point, me. It really is. It's, you know, it's it's the, and I don't know how many times we say it even here or anywhere else when we all get together, it's the, it's the preaching to the choir. You know, we start talking and all of us are nodding our heads, which is great. Um, but how do we get other people to nod their heads also and, and make this make sense for others? Um, and so what does that PD look like? I'm even afraid to call things PD anymore because the minute you say PD, people are like, no, I'm going to pass. I, I don't have energy for that right now. Um, and so it's just, I, go ahead, Mia. So I was going to say for us, the way that change has happened is because we've been doing this and knocking on those doors so hard. Mm -hmm. But then what happened is like, I keep on preaching it. I keep on like being an accommodations evangelist, whatever you want to call an accomplice. What happened is um, districts start getting are starting to get sued and starting to get on um, uh, things brought upon them because of accommodations, because they're not because they're denying accommodations, because they're not giving accommodations. Well, now that has opened the door for like, oh wow, maybe our gen ed teachers should be involved in this and they should know what the definition of assistive technology is and they should know what universal design is. Well, yeah, they know what universal design is, but they don't know how it applies to accommodations and assistive technologies. My big thing that I say is all assistive technologies are accommodations, at least based on the rules in Florida. All assistive technologies are accommodations. However, all accommodations are not assistive technologies. And when we, right? So when we can understand that all assistive technologies are accommodations and, and we're getting sued about accommodations, oh man, we, we had people like we had people in our PD this year and like the district people were coming to our PD going, oh, they might have something important to say. And so then the district people came to our PD and they were like, you know, you guys brought up a good point. And now we're doing more hands on problem solving at our school based teams to introduce to them. Hey, and, and we work with them to like, these are the questions you want to ask. And I think it's really is about asking questions, mm -hmm. not so much about telling people, but when you get a kid or when you get a situation, what are the questions you're asking yourself? Has AT been considered? Do you know that AT in most cases is an accommodation and vice versa, right? So like learning what questions to ask and that is really making the district, that is making the, the difference in some of our districts. Yeah, that's such a good point. It really is. It, it's, this, it's, it's this coaching mindset, this, this coaching all not just the coaching of the special ed teachers, but it's a it's this universal kind of coaching approach to things and, and that asking questions. So funny that you say that, Mia. I'm rereading my favorite, one of my favorite coaching books. Um, you can't, it's gonna fade out of my thing here. The Coaching Habit, Say Less, Ask More, and Change the Way You Lead Forever. There you go. There's my book recommendation for the day because I just pulled that out and I'm re, I'm re going through that. So yeah, it's a great question. And with the book recommendation, you're welcome. You're killing, you're killing my Amazon cart. My you're welcome. You want me to give you another one that just came yesterday? No, I won't. I'm not going to do it. I just got another one yesterday too. I'm going to keep it to myself. I'll drop that on you on Wednesday during AT chat. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Mike. Uh, Mia wants you to drop the name of the book in the chat. Okay. Mia, I can do that for you. And I think you're right about some of the. You were saying that some of the districts are starting to get sued and everything. I've seen it in a couple of district complaint processes through the State Department here in Oklahoma recently. And one of the things that they say is we don't know how to evaluate assistive technology. And even if they've gone to Oklahoma Able Tax course, which is a great course, they still aren't great. And so then they say, well, we'll let you do an IEE and go get an assistive technology evaluation but Gretchen, I've yet to find anyone in the state who's valued, <laughs> except for maybe someone at your at your building. And, and so we don't even have anyone in the state to be an independent evaluation for assistive technology in any form or fashion. And I always think that's such a, here comes my soapbox moment. Um, 
I always think that's so interesting, this idea of us of us constantly leaning on evaluations and, and instantly discounting that consultative model, um, which is we've all seen is so much more powerful. Um, mm -hmm. I would I would trade a hundred evaluations for a, a, a three or four visit activity with a team and a student. Um, they will get a much better solution. It may seem like it's not going to be faster, but it really yeah. will be because those and evaluations at times are kind of they're drive by, you know, and it's so frustrating. But I still don't. I still don't have somebody who can come in and do that effectively in our state. Yeah. Except yeah, for Oklahoma Able Tech, I mean, there's a few of us who enjoy assistive technology, and I can't tell you how many times I'm called and said, hey, will you come do an evaluation? I won't come have an evaluation, but I'll come have a chat with your team, Yeah. but I'm not qualified to do an evaluation, yeah. and you're not, that's not what you're looking for, and trying to get teachers who have no concept, especially in our rural districts, they're they're hurting to even just get, understand Google sometimes. Yeah. Um, and yeah. It, it's hard. Yeah. And I think you know, not not that this will be reassuring, maybe, but uh, it was a three to five year process in our district to get us from the place where we we do very few evaluations, and we put this front fronted process in where we talk through. Um, we call them screenings. Uh, it's not my favorite word, but they, they do a Google form. It's based in Joy Zabala set framework, right? Mm -hmm. They give us all that information up front about what they've already tried. And then we go out and, and kind of go to the team and say, okay, have you tried this? Have you tried that? We lead them through that consideration process next. And I will tell you, it has over the years, we've been now doing it. I don't know. This is year five or six we have so many less formal evaluations and the kids are getting the tools in their hands way quicker. Um, the very first year I did this job, which is what led to me shifting this process was the very first year I got a formal request for evaluation for what ended up being adapted paper and a pencil grip. And I was like, no more, we're not doing that. Like, we're not gonna make them wait up to 60 days so that I can come out and say, you need different paper and a pencil grip. Um, so it was a lot of a lot of seeking out training and providing training to our school-based OTs, our PTs, uh, our speech language pathologists. So they are my frontline people. And most of the time it's, they do a lot of consideration in the very beginning. And when they get to the point where they're like, mm, I don't really know what to try next. They're often the ones that are submitting my screening forms to me. Like I just got one today from an OT who said, I think they're ready for something else, but I don't know what else to try. Great. Submit the screening form and then let's have a conversation about what have you tried? What's next? Um, really where we do consented evals and it's a choice our district has made is we do mostly consented evaluations when we're looking at a funded device for communication. Mm -hmm. So most, some places do not do, the, their school district has chosen not to do the funding process and make them go see private therapists. We have a lot of students who don't have a private SLP. So we've chosen as a district to take that process on and we do the funded evaluations I know Jennifer does too in her district. So like, uh, that's the place where we get most of our consented vows for kids that need access supports. We are getting them in place through the screening process. And many of them never, ever come to a full avow. The only other time I've done them is for exit kids who are wanting to fund things through voc rehab. Mm -hmm. They want a formal evaluation on exit for voc rehab. And I will write, they use a computer, they use this, they use snap and read, they use this, and we get voc rehab to fund it that way. But otherwise it's a hundred percent through our, through our, our screening and support process. And I will tell you it's shifted how teachers think about it. It shifted how administrators think about it. Um, and again, but again, I, like Tiffany, like the good news, bad news is we got there. It was just a multi-year process to get there. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I mean, even one of our larger districts in the state has been highlighted on one of our favorite programs as having and had them out to do a, you know, a demo of how they've made great advancements in their district and everything. The same week that that video was posted on that national website, I had a student in that district request speech to text and text to speech help, and we're told it wasn't available in the district. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have that large of a disconnect, disconnect. even in some of our districts, yeah. um, you know, and it's, it's crazy to me.
And I don't know how we make that part better. And I see Gretchen's eyes just going. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting, Tiffany, and Brian brought it up in the chat and it's something I was going to, I was going to call Sarah out. I'm glad she put her camera on so I can watch her face when I call her out. Um, but Brian mentioned the work that we're doing in Michigan with Alt Shift and Sarah works at Alt Shift and, and we collaborate on this, this idea of working with teams at a local level to get them to understand the process, but more importantly, get them to recognize you have valuable members of your staff already who can do these things. Yes, you don't have an AT specialist, but you know what? Coming from an AT specialist, who cares that you don't have one? Doesn't matter. If you have other people that have those skills, you have what you need to potentially meet some of the needs like Alyssa was mentioning. If there's someone, if you can tap into an OT who knows adapted pencils and adapted paper, and you can get something that same day, why does that need to elevate to an AT evaluation? It doesn't. It doesn't. And yeah. again, yeah. then then if you do have an AT specialist in your district or you contract or whatever, then you're reaching out for the kids who have super intense needs, Correct. who have high tech needs. And again, I my OTs, um, my PTs, my classroom teachers, a lot of them take on the ownership of like, hey, let's try some things and let's see what, you know, and, and again, I have classroom teachers that are not tech, that are tech phobic, and they're really good at the low tech strategies. And I have other teachers or paras or OTs that are like, it's why I love hiring brand new grads as OTs. They are super tech friendly and they will jump in and figure out how to make something work right alongside a student. Um, but, but it is that process of getting people to understand like assistive technology isn't scary. It's just technology tools that people use and it's matching up. Who is this kid? Who is this learner with what do we really need to do um, to be able to to uh, to support support them given their academic need? It could be different in social studies or science. And and we're almost Alyssa at a better spot now, in a sense, because there is so much technology in our schools. People are less afraid of technology, but they just still might not understand the depth of what they have in front of you, which goes to Tiffany's comment. Right. I got, I have read and write. Well, my student needs text to speech. Well, I don't have that. Okay. Well, wait a second. You do because that's what that does. So again, it's that it's helping people make those connections and, and, and those correlations of, wait a second, you're asking for something. I've been using this with my whole class, but wait, that can be used that specific feature to meet this need, like Alyssa just mentioned and, and making them come to those realizations or helping them get there to those realizations becomes critical. Um, and there are people in our schools, I've yet to go to a school that I haven't stumbled across some educator that is really tech savvy, but maybe that tech savviness, I don't know if that's the phrase, but whatever, um, that tech savviness never leaves their classroom or it, may, it just doesn't extend out. Maybe they're not as uh, extroverted and it gets out there to everyone, but somehow we managed to kind of stumble across it. Um, the skills are there. Oh, did Sarah, did you put that in the chat? I was going to stop talking so I could find it. Thank you. Sarah, put it in the chat. Sarah, explain what that is. It's awesome. All right. So first of all, I'm going to apologize. I don't sound like I normally do. Um, I'm losing my voice. But uh, what we did is Jeff Dietrich is our project director. And so he looked at all of the individual um, organizations out there. So AOTA, looking at ASHA, looking at what are all the roles and responsibilities that I as a speech therapist should have as it relates to assistive technology. And so when we partner with districts, we pull this up and we use it as a way for them to understand like as a PT, I have a place at the table as a school social worker, as a teacher, and it's having that conversation. It's also because we've had some directors say, my people just, that's not in their wheelhouse. You know, they, they don't know, they shouldn't know that. Um, so to be able to say, hey, look at what their professional organization is putting out in regards to their roles and responsibilities to support assistive technology. And it's helping people. When I worked at an ISD, we did this. We gave it to all of our staff. And what it helped us do is identify our current reality in terms of professional development. Where were our strengths? Where were our needs? How could we match up people who felt that they had really solid skills in the area of positioning, but maybe they needed something here? 
And so really building the expertise of our staff versus always having people do what you guys are talking about, waiting for the expert to come. And what ends up happening is students don't have access to the tools that they need. Awesome. It's awesome. It, ha it, has, it has the skills on the first few pages of each of your team members, and then it has blank sheets at the back end where people can self-assess. Like, hey, what are you good at? What do you think you do well? Um, and they can start documenting that. And so now you have that information for your team. It is really cool. And it does look like a Girl Scout cookie order form, but that's part of the charm of it. So when you look at it, you will appreciate that. Natalie, I see your hand. Jump in here. Yeah, I just I just had a comment about um, some of the tools that maybe are already going on, um, like like you have read and write, but don't but asking you know for speech to text or something. But um, I know I would have conversations with teachers about that. It's like you, I think a lot of times they don't know that the tools that they're using more universally can be assistive technology. They just think that it's you know it's just well it's what I do in my classroom, so it's not assistive technology, but I always tried to have them think about um, when they made those comments, like, but it needs to, you need to make sure that if they were to leave this classroom or leave this school district or leave this state and, you know, the receiving agency got the IEP, would they know that this student needs this tool or this feature or something like that? Um, so, and that, I mean, that kind of helped them to frame it that a, that a universal tool could be. And, and often is, you know, an assistive technology. Um, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem of where or when or how to document it, but it kind of helped them frame some of their thinking about it, that they did know what they were, they had skills and they knew what the student needed. Um, and it just kind of helped them kind of clarify that a little bit. Yeah, I think you're right, Natalie. And, that, and also that idea of uh, when, we're, when we're talking to team members, I, I know I try to do this a lot is constantly highlighting, even in our conversation, how these features are helping someone and talking th that language all the time, like uh, of trying to help them make those connections as we go forward uh, and understand deeper the things that they actually have access to. Um, and, you know, I, I could soapbox again, the idea of we have so much technology and yet no one not everyone knows their built-in tools that are just in the technology already that could be helping them. And, and, and I always feel like if we could get that across to people, that would also be incredibly eye-opening. Like, oh, wait, I have something to at least start. Um, and, and that would go a long way to demystifying it also. That's a lot about what this, my presentation this week was. That was what they came to me. They're like, all these schools have these devices and they don't know how, they don't realize when or where it's that, you know, when do I call it assistive technology? When is it something that's just available in my classroom? So. Yeah. And, 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 and that's, and you know, that's a skill building like anything else, Rebecca, right? Understanding it, 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 it's one thing to have a recognition that something is there, but having a deeper understanding of how I might use it to save me from calling the AT specialist and, and, and maybe, that builds over time. Uh, like Alyssa said, this is a long, this is a, this is a, you're playing the long game here. Um, this is not something that you're going to solve in, in a month. Um, but if you could build some awareness that then leads to some usage, which then leads to um, people sharing that across classrooms. I always feel like I've done my job in a school when someone says, I heard from a teacher you had been working with. Then I know I'm doing the, my job right because they are talking to each other about things and they're making deeper connections. And maybe that saved me from going into one other classroom to solve a very similar need because they're working to solve them themselves, which is exciting. Very much. I, I, they're just struggling with that. And that's, I think, why they wanted me to come in and then just to how to write, where to write it. Um, my, my district and specific, specifically are like, well, we have that wrote as an accommodation. Why would we write it as a system tech? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's a great conversation. And, and now yeah. we're running into some testing issues that, you know, if you don't have a math verification, you can't use a calculator on the system tech or on the test. Well, if they absolutely need to have it and you have a wrote as AT, that might 
solve some of that problem, but that's not how we look at that. Yeah. It's understanding the processes that interconnect. Go ahead, Mia. So I was just going to say that that is exactly why we continue to fight for um, the assistive technology people at the state and district levels to work with the compliance people. Mm -hmm. Because it's the, what I liken, to, liken it as is, for example, when we went to write um, the, the uh, access point standards, which if you guys don't know, in Florida, we have, um, uh, we have uh, standards, right? We have curriculum standards and they're you know, for um, general education um, and, and exceptional student education. Um, and then we have access point standards, which is access to the general ed. Um, uh, there's a DLP. If you guys are familiar with the DLP that some other states have adopted that, it's for students um, that that would not, like it's been identified, the team identifies that working on the gen ed standards is just not the, you know, not the right place for them, um, whatever. At any rate, when we were going to write those standards, the access points in ELA and in math, um, they took an ESE teacher who works with that population and they took a math content specialist and they put them together. Now, if they would just have taken an ESE specialist to write the math standards, do you think it would have come out as well? Or if they would have just taken a math specialist, but not the ESE, right? So I, I don't see, like, it seems to me it would be pretty obvious <laughs> that when we are looking at accommodations and assistive technology, especially within the e IEP, that states would eventually get a little, you know, wise to the fact that you need both content specialists. You need the uh, you need the compliance content specialist and you need the assistive technology content specialist to be able to fully, you know, to fully um, share that information and address that information and do PD around that information, et cetera, et cetera. But obviously it's not obvious because we've been fighting that for seven years. And, and even with that fight, we still keep on going back to compliance specialists just giving the information and they never share it correctly because they may not have been exposed to the assistive technology um, you know, content um, expert part of it. So, sorry. Here. No, don't be sorry. That made tons of sense. You're absolutely right. Yeah, for sure. And Sarah mentioned the idea of when we're when we're doing the training, um, we're always excited when we have AT people at the um, at the table. Sometimes those AT people are a little nervous to be at our table because everything we say is about the idea that your AT person is not as important as you think they are. They love that, um, but but it's important to talk to them as well and, and, and encourage the AT people is that you have a bigger role here. You have a bigger purpose that you can do. You can really affect change at a larger level if you can facilitate some of these solutions happening at the educator level. Then you can spend your time doing other things, which is great. Um, and then, oh, it's our, it's our, uh, how to start a movement video. Is that what that is, Sarah? I'm looking at you. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. We, we talk about this idea and it is the greatest YouTube video ever. It's how to start a movement. And uh, it, it talks about leaders and first followers and getting people to come along for your ride um, and, and reminding people that the leader is not as important as the first follower. And it's the first follower that other people will follow and emulate. So we need to get people on board. Um, Otherwise, you are officially the lone nut. And, and you know, it, I, I feel like we are a screen full of lone nuts right now until we find our people that are, no offense, none, hopefully none taken, um, until we find our followers that jump on board and come with us. And I think that's so important when we're thinking about this capacity building at um, school levels. So important. And I think, Mike, that brings us to the last set of questions that people have brought up about how are AT consultants or services written into IEPs? How is that accounted for? Do people put minutes in? Do they do consultation only? How's that happen in your area?
I don't think them ever really wrote into the IEP. I just am there. <laughs> like they, they need something and they holler and I pop over. I do more than just that. So anytime we have an issue, like I have a, just a request form, like, Hey, I need your help. And they fill it out. And then, you know, I just pop back into their building if I, they need something or do stuff like that. So that I am, I'm there and making sure the kids get what they, what they need for, you know, and like training my, my, my boss has told me that's just your job. That's just what you do. Like, we don't need to write training in the IEP because you're just going to go do it. Cause that's just what we do. That's just good service. <laughs> you know, um, one of the reasons that this question came up um, was about funding. And I think one of our of the questions that the leadership team developed was about how does the way you do um, IEP documentation affect funding. I've been hearing um, a movement that actually makes me a little nervous lately, which is to put specific minutes of AT specialists or specific minutes of AT services um, into IEPs and then tie that to funding for particularly for agencies that serve multiple districts. And um, it, it's making me nervous because that takes us directly back to the kinds of models that we've been saying this morning we need to get away from. Um, you know, I, Rebecca, you talking about, I don't, I'm not even on the IP because professional development is my job. But if, if the, if somebody is paying per minute for your services, which is an, I think a, an idea that somebody thinks is good right now. I don't, I don't think it's everybody, but I wanted to have a conversation about it because it, it it makes me very nervous in terms of changing our, our current models to go back to a more expert model. So, and I'm, I'm just gonna speak to that because I'm one of the people that that's how I get on kids' IEPs. Right. So I'm written in by minutes. So it's got to do, I mean, for me, it's got to do with what is that service? That is my service just directly working with that student, which it isn't it is in those cases. So it's the consultative model. So I have, you know, like 10 consultative hours to that team um, throughout the school year for a particular student. And so now it's about what am I doing with those 10 hours? Right. You know, am I sitting those 10 hours in meetings? Am I, no, um, am I working with the classroom teacher and the staff? You know, I think that's the important part of how you know we get written if you get written into IEPs and how that done. It also has to do with the differences between being an in-house, yeah, like AT person and an outsider. But what's that outsider doing? Because I certainly have met outside AT people that you know they come in, they do their job, there's nothing left except whatever they've determined, and no PD has happened, no inf informing of the local people and off they go. Um, that that model concerns me, that expertise model piece. Yeah, and Kelly, I, uh, I, when you started talking, I thought, well, of course an outside person would have to be in the IP um, at, at some level, or it's certainly that's a, a, to me, a valid model for doing, but I think the distinction you made with in-house people is the trend I'm seeing that's making me really nervous. I'm, I'm like you, I have a couple of contracts where I'm working with individual teams and you know I track every single hour and every single minute and, and that's how the money flows. But if you're salaried as an AT person for your district or for you know whatever your salary calls, I, that, that seems like it runs the danger of saying, oh, well, we, we can only have an AT person if they're on the IEP 
And then there's a below the line, above the line conversation too that happens. Uh, yeah, so we, we made a decision to, um, for students who are like brand new getting an AAC system to put what I call fading supports on the IEP. So we would put 30 minutes a week for two months followed by this, followed by this. And a lot of times it ends up in that supports for school personnel section yeah. because it's not just a direct service to the child. But, you know, my question is all of our IEPs, you know, assistive technology is a related service. So under our related service section, we have a space for not only assistive technology devices to be documented, but for that service to be documented. And if we're not documenting, you know, I'm an in-house person, but if we're not documenting it, there if it is a direct like we're going to see that kid every week for x number of times then i don't know where we would document you know um but but most of the time it's district at on a consultative basis in a supports for school personnel kind of role that we try to sling to you know it's that initial income in, com in combination with us writing an implementation plan saying okay this this team and the student needs x number of more intensive supports again faded over that year i never put 30 minutes a week of of AT service on a kid's IEP for the entire duration of the IEP. To add on to what Alyssa said, we also will do that um, when there's a transition in school. So um, if the student's transitioning from elementary to middle school, we feel like we can come in and we can train that new team on that assistive technology device um, or the AEC device and really help support to make that a successful transition. Um, otherwise, sometimes that follow through doesn't happen. So again, we write that on a fading sort of service schedule where we're coming in and providing some of that in-servicing training, maybe right at the beginning of the school year. And then we're kind of following up with the team, maybe every quarter or trimester, just to make sure that that team is being successful in implementing that new system. So we, again, take that fading services um, standpoint as well. We, we do a little bit of a combination of we try to provide, uh, we try to look at who would be the most uh, skilled in the related service staff to provide support and put it, support to personnel under uh, AT and that person. So like AT and OT, so that AT can fade out more quickly and OT can kind of follow that through and call us back in. Um, and so that people are kind of getting that capacity building concept. And then uh, the other thing is there's a kind of IEP in the state uh, that's called safety net, and there's a lot of different funding applied to it. And if it's a safety net IEP, we, we write things in order to make sure that we're getting the funding that's necessary for the equipment and for the students. So we're a little more specific. We can be a little more specific on those, uh, but we try to keep it so that um, the support continues, but it's not being supported through an AT department, it's supported through the student team, and then AT supports that team. Well, that's really interesting, Irene. That's really interesting. Excellent. Well, everybody, it's five after. We've done it. Congratulations. Um, we still have more questions. We kind of skipped over one of the slides. Maybe we will revisit at some point in the future. Um, we'll continue on. I want to be respectful of your time uh, on this Monday and uh, get you back to work. But uh, I appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate the members of the Quiet Leadership Team joining us today to share their insights and get the conversation rolling. It was wonderful. I will put the recording up sometime later today. There was so much in the chat that I think I'll take the chat document and I'll strip all your names out of it and I'll attach that to the recording in the notes part on YouTube. So I'll put a link to it to a Google Doc or something. Unless it's not long enough that I can just put it right in there and that I'll see. I'll work on that later. Um, some, but I will, because there's so much there, I don't, I don't want you guys to miss it. Um, but I will make sure to take your names out of it as we go. All right. Well, everybody, it was a pleasure. Have a good rest of the week. Join us on Wednesday for AT Chat. If not, we'll see you next Monday for Town Hall. Have yourselves a good week. <laughs>